topic is complementary and alternative treatments for insomnia. Um, in full disclosure, about half of it. Um, so this is a kind of a monster topic. Um, so you'll see kind of the approach that I took to help narrow some things down. So it's not all inclusive, um, but it definitely focuses a little bit more on the, the evidence that's available for these agents. So we're going to identify some of the complementary and alternative medication approaches for the treatment of insomnia. We're going to compare the efficacy of them, and then we're going to look at any adverse effect considerations. To get started, um, so in, there are two main topics that I want to make sure we're all on the same page for. Uh, first is insomnia. So the dictionary definition um, is the inability to obtain sufficient sleep especially when it's chronic and it could be difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, waking up too early in the morning, um, as well as causing some functional impairment the following day. I chose this definition over the definition in the DSM-5, specifically because as we look at a number of these trials, um, they span a relatively large period of time, um, and they all use slightly different definitions. So getting to the core of looking at sleep problems, some of them didn't even require an insomnia diagnosis, but a certain score on whatever um, sleep indicator that they were using for measurement. So we're gonna use that big broad definition. The other thing I think is important is um, complementary and alternative medicine. So um, according to the US National Library of Medicine, it is a group of diverse medical and healthcare practices and products that are not presently considered to be part of conventional medicine. And I wanted to put this out there at first um, because what we're gonna talk about today is going to be um, some herbal and supplemental products, but also looking at evidence for non-pharmacologic interventions, um, which I am not an expert in, but I will give you a rundown of um, the evidence as I've been able to go through it. So for insomnia treatment consideration, sleep hygiene really is one of the largest factors. There are repeated, um, I was looking for it and I couldn't find, um, I couldn't find it. There was just an article that was on um, BBC over the last two weeks that talked about um, sleep and the fact that in America, um, there are a lot of sleep myths that we tend to um, continue to hang on to, and a large number of them go back to good sleep hygiene. Um, so maintaining a consistent schedule. So the whole, yeah, let's catch up on sleep on the weekends is not a good idea, and repeatedly is shown to not be a good idea. Um, some variability is fine, but for the most part, trying to maintain that consistent schedule. Having a bedroom that's quiet and comfortable without electronics, so no TV, no Kindles, no... Um, iPads, no phones, so getting the electronics out of the bedroom. And there's also quite a few um, products now that have timers that will actually change the light um, that's being emitted to decrease the blue light, which seems to be associated with reducing your melatonin levels and making it more difficult for you to fall asleep later on. Um, but the bedroom really needs to be um, reserved for sleep and sexual activity and keep all of the other activities, eating, watching things, reading, um, playing games, all of that stuff outside. Avoiding large meals, alcohol or caffeine prior to bedtime, making sure that you're physically active consistently throughout the day. Um, and then also if you're unable to go to sleep, prompting yourself to get up after about 20 minutes um, and go do something relaxing, whether that's making yourself a cup of tea, whether it's reading, having warm milk, taking a bath, listening to music, just doing something relatively relaxing, not incredibly stimulating, to then try to go back to sleep when you feel sleepy. So those really are the core foundational components that should be recommended to anyone who has sleep difficulty. Um, what we're gonna cover are things that could be done in addition to these, not in place of them, but in addition to. 
Now, the reason um, that we're looking at complementary and alternative medications is because there are some fundamental issues with our pharmacologic options. Um, so our sedative hypnotics, the Z drugs, the benzodiazepines, um, do have a risk of individuals um, misusing them, and that could be problematic. It also could be problematic for some of our older patients who tend to have a higher incidence of insomnia. We have the melatonin receptor agonists, um, and for full disclosure, I'm actually not going to talk about melatonin today um, because we have those receptor agonists. I kind of put those in this bucket and focused on some other agents. And then we're seeing an increasing off-label use of um, sedating antidepressants. So tricyclic antidepressants, your um, amitriptyline, doxepin, as well as second generation agents. So olanzapine and quetiapine. They're being used off-label specifically for insomnia at relatively low doses, but I'm gonna argue that's a relatively significant adverse effect burden for questionable benefit on the efficacy side. So let's look at what some other options might be. Um, actually, let's look at who the problem is with, and then we'll look at what those options are. So according to the U.S. National Health Interview Survey, um, about just over 17% of adults reported insomnia or some other type of regular sleep disturbance. So again, one of the reasons why we're using that really broad definition of insomnia today. About Four and a half percent of them use complementary or alternative therapy in order to treat whatever their sleep condition was. Um, so that means my little people there at the bottom, essentially one out of five people that you're seeing may have some type of sleep issue within the last month. So that's not an insignificant number. Interestingly, um, when we look at general uh, US survey data, more than half of those um, responding to this say that they will use and seek out complementary and alternative medications to maintain their health and well being. In some cases, it's preventative, in some cases, they're looking to um, actually actively treat something that they have. But only 60% of them will report their use to their provider. Um, so we have about half of people that are using these, but half of that number, so only a quarter are presenting to you actually telling you that you're using these. So this really should be something we want to think about and ask what they're doing to make sure we have a clear picture of everything that's going on. And how well do they think they work? Um, so over 70% um, were using these methods to um, treat insomnia. About half said they helped a great deal and about a third said they helped some. Um, so really about three quarters are saying we're getting some efficacy from these medications. And when they look specifically at the folks that are using complementary and alternative medicine, they're more likely to be younger folks as well as those with a higher education level. So finishing some type of post um, high school education. So if you look overall, there are um, a number of different Recognizing the amount of time that I had, there's a number of different reports of efficacy. Um, full disclosure, essential oils um, could be a topic unto itself. I did not have time to go through everything, so I'm specifically going to leave them out, but there is some evidence looking at that. Um, I went to, I like the evidence, and I know Dr. Ballester always asks about the evidence, so I wanted to make sure I had some concrete information to give you. So there are two systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Both of them are a little bit older. This was the most recent. So what these authors did is they did a robust literature evaluation and they looked for randomized controlled trials that had at least 30 patients who were on an intervention for at least a week. So they were trying to set up parameters so it was at least higher quality evidence to provide recommendations off of they needed some type of controllable intervention. So either a placebo group, a sham group um, for some of the interventions, which we'll talk about in just a second, or against a, another active comparator. And they wanted some type of measurable outcome. So it couldn't just be patient report um, or diary information. It needed to have some more objective findings on their outcomes. So as they looked, there were 506 publications identified, only 64 of them actually met this criteria. And when they looked specifically to make sure that it fulfilled all of these criteria, they ended up with only 20. Um, so 
one of my take homes is going to be we have a limited amount of, of solid evidence in this area. There were three buckets that these interventions fell into, manual therapies, herbal supplements, and mind and body therapies. Um, for the record, we will go through all of them. I will do my best with each of them. Um, the middle column I am most comfortable with. That is definitely more within my wheelhouse. Um, but I learned a lot putting this presentation together. So I'll share what I learned with you. For the manual therapies, they included both acupuncture and acupressure. Um, I didn't know what the difference was between the two. Um, so acupuncture is the actual Chinese medical practice that uses the sharp insertion of needles. So they're those teeny tiny ultra fine needles that really don't necessarily um, draw blood, but that are placed into specific points, um, pressure points throughout the body. Acupressure is more of a type of massage where there is specific pressure placed on a on one of the pressure points, um, and it's used for the same reason, um, but it does not require the needles or the certification of an acupuncture um, specialist to be able to do that, which made me think, so my brother has migraines. Um, he actually had a Chiari malformation, and when he was little, they had taught him about the hard P right in your hand to use that for migraine therapy. So they've been using this, um, I wanted to see how long, since the 1860s, they've actually been promoting different acupressure um, instances or recommendations. So there was a decent amount of literature. There are six randomized trials. Um, for these trials, the duration ranged between two and eight weeks, so by no means is this chronic therapy. Their sample size, they had an average about 74 patients, although it did range between 44 and 180 patients. Now, what they found is that there were, um, there are three trials. I have your, your beautiful faces on the side, but it's on where the effect size is, so I'm going to do this off of memory. Um, three of the trials showed no difference. Um, so there was no difference between the acupuncture or, um, and either the placebo or what they called a sham group. So the sham group was they would still use needles, but not put them in the appropriate pressure point places. Um, so they would do them in other locations um, to still stim. Um, the patients were not aware of whether or not it was the correct location. So that was kind of how they were able to control that. What I want to draw your attention to and why I felt compelled to include this is the effect size. So the effect size for the three trials that were found to be different um, are relatively large. So this was based on a um, modified Cohen's D effect size. So if you remember back, 0.8 is considered a large effect size. The effect sizes they found with these three trials, the lowest is 1.3 and the highest is 2.1. So relatively robust efficacy from these. So just to look a little bit closer, um, that second trial down, it was a four week trial. They need, used a needle rolling. So it was actually, it looked like a lint roller that had little needles um, that they would use over particular places in the body. Um, and we'll look at those locations in just a couple minutes. And what they found was that um, they used the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. So this, um, just as a reminder, it's a self-rated questionnaire. It has 19 items. It looks at sev seven different components. So um, subjective sleep quality, how the patient feels that they slept, sleep latency, how long it took them to get to sleep, sleep duration, so how long they were sleeping, um, habitual sleep efficiency, so how much were they sleeping when they were actually in bed trying to sleep, um, and the number of sleep disturbances, they also look at use of sleep medications and daytime dysfunction. So this goes from zero to 21, but the cutoff of a five is usually where um, the delineation is. If you're under a five, you're less likely to have sleep problems. If you're above a five, you're more likely to have sleep problems. So at baseline, these patients had a score of 16. Um, so they did have relatively robust sleep issues. They saw an improvement in the group that got the um, active acupuncture treatment with a reduction in that Pittsburgh sleep quality um, inventory down to a 10 over the course of those four weeks. 
So they did see a relatively significant decrease. Um, there were no reported adverse effects or issues um, between the groups, and this was considered to be equal um, to the improvement that they saw in the patients who were put on clonazepam, um, so what we would consider a, a routine pharmacologic intervention. The other two um, are the two that are, the last two that are listed toward the bottom. Um, so the Nordio study was three weeks. Um, they used acupressure in um, wrist band heart seven acupoint. I'm gonna show you pictures in a couple minutes. Um, so, so they did it in a different location than the abdominal one that um, the Huang group had used. So they had done this um, and what they found was that there was a significant improvement um, in the quality of sleep for the patients who were using acupuncture compared to those that just had a placebo wristband. Um, so again, they saw a significant change in that Pittsburgh sleep quality index. The last group by Chen was um, again a four week trial and they used both hand sites as well as some sites on the head. Um, and they saw there was a significant change for each of the groups. Um, and they saw improvement in sleep latency, sleep duration, as well as subjective sleep quality. So the patients felt that they were sleeping much better. So those were relatively robust changes. Um, and here are some of the sites that have been identified as acupuncture um, pressure sites for the treatment. So there are quite a few at the back of the head. Um, so I learned that they use number uh, letters and numbers, um, but then most of them have other names. Um, so the, the pictures go along with that. So B38 is actually thought to be in um, at the heart, but in the heart level in the back. Um, and they actually, there's quite a few, um, quite a few programs that recommend people who are having trouble with insomnia lay on their back with tennis balls um, in between their shoulder blades specifically to activate this particular point. Um, we talked about the pericardium, so on that, um, some of the ones on the wrist, this is where they were using, so it's that red dot there at the bottom um, in the middle of the forearm. And then there's also another one that's just underneath the wrist. Um, so those were both of the pressure points that were activated in that second, that Nordio study. The urinary bladder, the B10, um, is right at the back of the neck. That was one of the ones that was activated in the first trial. And then the GB20 um, is also in the back, right at the base of the skull. That was also one of the ones that was activated in the first one. So each of these did show some benefit um, in the trials that they had included. There's a couple more that are here. Um, I want to show, um, so the, the one that focused on the abdomen um, did include this pressure point. Um, so the one that shows right in the center of the breastbone, that's CV17. Um, it's called the Sea of Tranquility Point. But some of the references that I found said that it really should be used in combination with the GV24.5. Um, so the governing vessel 24.5, which is the one that's right between um, the eyes on the forehead. So that one is a little bit different because um, they did just use the abdominal one, so from the breastbone, and then they used a couple other that were across the belly. There have been some reports with some on the ankles, um, but they weren't included in the three trials that had those significant um, improvements. So there are pressure points that can be used, um, both for acupuncture or acupressure. I can't move it, Jamie. Thank you. Um, so kind of wrap up for this little section, it, it may very well be beneficial. They, they did not find any um, significant adverse effects. Nobody had any um, complications as a result of being in the active treatment groups. And those effect sizes were relatively large. There's a big amount of variability. So each of them used a different patient population and all three of them use different um, acupuncture sites. So we do need some additional information. 
But um, I would propose that this may potentially be an option, especially in patients who have a lot of other comorbidities or, or where there is concern about using conventional pharmacologic treatments. Um, in at least one of the trials, when they went to look longer term, the, the improvement in their sleep had been maintained even after the acupuncture intervention had stopped. Um, so it wasn't something that only occurred when they were having the intervention. They may actually continue to see improvement. And some of the sites actually encourage patients to use acupressure in some of those points to be able to um, assist themselves if they're having trouble with insomnia. So that's one, one option. Looking at herbal and supplemental therapy, so this was our second, our middle bucket, they had the most amount of um, data available. So there were 10 randomized trials, their duration similar, two to eight weeks. Um, they had a little bit bigger sample sizes, so about 150 patients in each group. I'm gonna break this into three groups because there were three main products that they found efficacy for. So tryptophan was the first one. Um, so there are three studies that are included here in the tryptophan group. So tryptophan's a neutral, um, amino acid, it's processed, it, we get it in our diet um, from fish and poultry and eggs and nuts and spinach. Um, we get it in our diet and it's processed into 5-hydroxytryptamine um, or serotonin. Um, so this is what people are talking about when they talk about how they get sleepy after they eat Thanksgiving dinner. Um, but these were looking at more pharmaceutical grade um, specific products of the tryptophan. So the first trial, the Hudson trial, was three weeks long and it actually used um, bars. So they had bars that were created. One of them used 250 milligrams of tryptophan that was derived from butternut squash seeds um, or 250 milligrams of pharmaceutically um, derived tryptophan or a placebo, which was just like a rolled oat bar. Um, so each of them got like this little energy bar and that was what they ate. What they found is that both the tryptophan food group and the um, supplement group were both superior to placebo. So they improved sleep time, they improved sleep efficiency, um, they decreased the number of times that patients were awake and overall improved the sleep quality um, compared to placebo. Again, they had kind of a significant effect size on that as well. They did not report any adverse effects. Um, and this, I do just wanna point this out, this is a relatively smaller dose than what is recommended for some other ones. Um, so they did see improvement. The second trial was an eight-week randomized crossover trial, and this looked at two different strengths of the tryptophan, so two grams, so 2,000 milligrams, um, versus essentially 40 milligrams of tryptophan versus placebo. Um, and what they found is that there was um, some, so the, the higher dose group um, had, they did not consistently find differences from placebo, we'll say that. They did see um, trends toward improvements in patients who were waking up during the night. So when they looked at subgroups, um, that particular group that had a lot of midnight awakenings tended to do better on the tryptophan group than on the placebo group. So it may be that just not an overall sleep issue can be improved by this, um, but maybe there's certain particular types, but they did not um, they did not find robust effects, but they also just used a sleep quality scale that was one to five. Um, it was very effective sleep and incredibly refreshing versus um, it was kind of terrible sleep and I, I feel completely exhausted. So it didn't use the validated scale that some of the other trials had used. So that throws a little bit of question on that. The last trial um, is the Hartman trial. So this was a two week long. They looked at the one gram of tryptophan and they had um, cecobarbital and they also had, um, can you move that? I forget what the other, it was a benzodiazepine, I believe. Um, Florazepam, thank you, um, compared to placebo. So they looked at a couple different control groups. What they found was that um, the tryptophan was no different from placebo 
the cecobarbital, which is very similar to phenobarbital, so definitely a sedative, was also no different from placebo. But the benzodiazepine did differ from placebo. Um, so they concluded that maybe there's not as much benefit um, with the tryptophan for all types of um, all types of insomnia. These patients did not have to have depression or anxiety, um, and some of the authors have postulated that maybe if they have those other comorbid conditions, these might be more beneficial. Um, but overall, there's kind of limited benefit consistently throughout the literature. I do want to point out that previously, tryptophan products had been pulled off the market because there had been um, a large number of patients that were diagnosed with eosinophilia myalgia syndrome, um, so severe muscle pain, nerve damage, skin changes. Um, that was thought to be due to a contaminant from the manufacturer that was um, an international manufacturer. They have not seen reports of this with newer versions of the tryptophan products. They are available over the counter. Um, most of the adverse effects that were reported were blurred vision, drowsiness, which is what they were kind of hoping for, um, heart palpitations, and a little bit of um, loss of muscle coordination. So they didn't feel quite as dexterous as they had been, which again, if you're trying to get somebody to go to sleep, that might be a good thing. Um, so safety-wise, it, it didn't look to be incredibly problematic. The next group, so valerian tends to have the largest amount of data overall. Um, so it was the valerian products, and you can see those five trials that are there. Um, so they do have one trial that had a relatively larger effect size. Um, overall, they did see some improvement with each of the valerian products, mainly on sleep quality. So patients were reporting that their sleep quality was better. Um, so maybe overall time wasn't better, but they felt that it was a much more restful sleep. Most of these trials used about five to 600 milligrams of the valerian, um, and they were about a month long. Um, they also had some robust increases um, in changes in the placebo groups. Um, so some of the placebo groups actually showed improvement in sleep latency by more than 20 minutes in the placebo group. Um, so potentially there's a psychological component. So if they're in a trial taking something that they think may help their sleep, they may just go to sleep faster, thinking that this is going to help them even if it just ended up being the sugar pill, um, because that is a little bit unusual, the finding that just because now you're on something, you're falling asleep 20 minutes faster. Um, they had more than 50% in two of these trials that reported adverse effects. They tended to be mild adverse effects, um, so dizziness, drowsiness, some um, gastrointestinal upset, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, but it was no different between um, the active group versus the placebo group. There's one trial, the third one down, um, the Ziegler trial that used oxazepam. One of the main findings for this was that if patients were using valerian and then they stopped, they did not have rebound effects afterward, which they did see in the group that had been on oxazepam. So if there are patients who are taking valerian because they feel that it improves the quality of their sleep, if they abruptly stop it, they should not expect to then have some type of rebound insomnia. So modest effects, um, maybe not as robust as we would hope, but it may be beneficial for some folks. The last group is the kava group. So there were only a couple um, products that were there. So kava um, has been used quite a bit for anxiety, is sometimes used for insomnia. It's thought to have some activity on the GABA receptors. Um, it may work on the GABA binding sites, but not the same ones that the benzos work on. Um, so that's where it's thought to have some action, and it may be beneficial in, a, in combination with other products. Um, so they had two trials, both of which were uh, a month long, and what they found was um, 
that in the first one, there was no difference between Cava, Valerian, or the placebo. Um, in the second one, they did have an improvement in the Cava group in the quality of sleep. Um, so when they looked at some of the other endpoints, there was no difference, but when they looked at just the quality of sleep, so again, the patients are feeling like it's a better sleep. So from a quality of life standpoint, that may be where that comes from. Kava's traditionally been um, recommended against because of the risk of liver damage. They did not report any significant adverse effects. Um, they used two to 300 milligrams of the kava only for a month, um, and they were not on other hepatotoxic medications, um, but it was not something that they found in either of those trials. So let's take a step back real quick. So looking at those three, um, there may be some, uh, some place for each of these, although the evidence is not consistent, nor is it incredibly robust. For tryptophan, there was some improvement in decreasing the number of awakenings and sleep latency. There was a wide range um, of doses that they used, but there weren't a lot of adverse effects that were reported. The valerian, again, had some improvement in the number of awakenings, but really that sleep quality seemed to be more of what the patients were reporting. But there were a significant number of adverse effects. They were mild, they were no different than the placebo group was reporting, but there were many more adverse effects. And then that kava group, some improvement with sleep quality um, and thankfully not many adverse effects. So potentially an option, maybe not something that you would want to go to first line, um, but if patients are looking for something that's um, not a prescription product, these would be ones that at least have some reports of efficacy. Patients should be on them for at least a month to see if there's any change. And it would be helpful if they're keeping a sleep diary so they'd be able to tell, yes, there is a difference versus no, it's really not doing too, too much. The last bucket of things was the mind and body therapies. So there were three trials that were included here. Um, the durations were longer, so 24 um, to 26 weeks, average of about 100 patients in each of these. Two of them were focused on Tai Chi, one of them was focused on yoga. Um, for the Tai Chi groups, um, so they were older patients that did have quite a bit of um, other comorbid medical conditions. And in one trial, they um, either were put in a Tai Chi group or they got some health education, which was um, encouraging sleep hygiene and just other healthy behaviors. In the other group, the other trial, they did um, a Tai Chi group and then a low impact group. So Tai Chi really is um, postures, gentle movements, mental focus, breathing, relaxation. So it's done in a particular manner. Um, the low impact exercise group was actually um, recommending stretching and deep breathing. Um, so still moving the muscles and encouraging the deep breathing, but not necessarily done in a more mindful way. What they found was that the Tai Chi had a significant impact on overall sleep outcomes. Um, so they saw improvements in sleep duration, in sleep latency, in sleep quality, in sleep efficiency. So overall, these patients were really sleeping much, much better. I do just want to call out, though, um, the Lee study, the second Tai Chi study, there was improvement in all of those subcategories significantly compared to that low impact group, but their overall Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index didn't improve a whole lot. So their baseline finding was 13 at endpoint, so at the end of those 24 weeks, it had um, dropped to just under 11. So it was a statistically significant improvement from baseline to endpoint, but there was a significant number of patients that were reporting improvement in some of these other areas. Um, so the actual primary finding wasn't incredibly robust, statistically significant, but I will argue clinically, I don't know that that's significant. But looking at all of those um, subgroups and in the improvement that was there, the patients definitely were feeling like they were sleeping better even if the objective um, score did not reflect that. The last one is for yoga. So this was a six month time frame. Um, so patients were um, put in the, uh, a yoga group. They were also older patients. And what they found was that there was, um, they improved their time to fall asleep. 
by more than 10 minutes, uh, an average of more than 10 minutes, and they improve their total sleep time by an average of more than an hour. Um, so for the patients who were engaged in yoga, they also saw relatively consistent improvements in sleep. So take home points, Tai Chi, it should be Tai Chi and yoga, um, may be really good interventions for folks that are not necessarily good candidates for some traditional sleep interventions. Um, they had some relatively robust findings in some of those patients where they, re they really just felt much better about their sleep, even if those specific numbers didn't change quite as much. So again, trying to get at more quality as opposed to um, trying to chase after a number that you're sleeping for seven hours. Well, if it's really restorative sleep, but it was only five or six hours, then, then that may be a good outcome. So there are a couple others. I'm just real quick going to um, address uh, chamomile. I know that there's been a lot of talk about, well, what about chamomile tea? There have been two trials that were done recently that saw no improvement compared to placebo. Um, so it really hadn't done anything. Passion flower is the other one um, that definitely comes up. It also, um, it has a couple reports of efficacy. There's some animal trials that are being done right now that look like maybe it will have some benefit, but there's really nothing standardized in um, human patients at this point. So that's why those weren't, um, weren't included. So overall, non-traditional methods, they really may be effective for, um, for your patients that are having insomnia, and they may be using them anyway, so it would be important to be asking what it is that they're doing. Um, herbal supplements may have a role depending on what their problems are. Um, so if it's they wake up a lot or if they are complaining about the quality of their sleep, um, then those might be options. But also it encourage them to think about other things. So acupuncture, acupressure, or the Tai Chi or yoga practices may be really beneficial. But this would be for relatively short term. We do not have long term data on any of these interventions. Um, so six months was the longest with the yoga and the Tai Chi. And there really was no safety complications with those. So that's what I've got for today. So we will stop share. I see that there's something in the chat. I just haven't seen that yet. Let's see. Haha. So um, <laughs> I'm glad that you asked that. So sleepy time tea. So one of the trials that looked at chamomile tea looked at chamomile tea as well as some of the chamomile um, blends of tea, and it was absolutely no different um, than placebo, uh, which was just more of like a hot water. Um, I think they infused it with something, um, but there was no benefit in any of the sleep outcomes, and that was just done a couple of years ago in a Taiwanese population. I have a question about the herbals. Um, if those would be used in com combination with an SSRI or a similar treatment for depression, anxiety, um, can you comment on the safety, this, the safety of that? So the tryptophan would be a concern. Um, with the use with SSRIs or even SNRIs. Um, the reason for that is um, you're giving the amino acid that can be um, converted into serotonin. So you do run the risk of increasing serotonin relatively robustly. Um, so that one really should be used in caution in patients that are on those others. Um, there aren't necessarily documented reports of significant toxicity, but it definitely increases the risk. Um, for valerian, it's been used um, in combination with antidepressants without any reports of um, 